Hello fellow code refinery enthusiasts. Welcome to Jupiter lesson. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Matthias and I work for code refinery. Nice to be here. And I'm another one. I'm so much looking forward to one and a half hours Jupiter. Hopefully we can get also some dramatic music in between when we then switch to exercises or come back from exercises. What is our exercise plan for today? We have two planned, maybe one. We, we might adjust one or two exercise session depending on how it goes. Yeah. The first one will be in around 15 minutes. The second one will be then in around one hour, but we will see. Yeah. Um, moving to the lecture material then. So Jupyter Notebooks, uh, the idea here is to get an idea what the Jupyter is as a tool and how to use it, when to use it. And uh, we start with this uh, motivation example. So there's a picture in the lecture notes. Uh, it compares the output and visual uh, difference between poor Python and then in Jupyter Notebook. And uh, it's kind of suggestive <laughs> example but the, uh, you can check out yourself which one of those code examples. So the small one here, pure Python, and this uh, Jupyter Notebook screenshot, which one of those looks more clear to uh, grasp with the first read. And uh, my, my perspective is that I really like this Jupyter interface for coding and for for reading others code yeah and we will discuss so we will give examples for when notebooks are a really good fit we will give examples for when notebooks are less of a good fit there will be a bit of python code so you will see python here because it's a tool that is very popular in the python community how about people who don't write any python should they still listen and i will answer that rhetoric question yes because we will also show you a few things that you can or that tools that you can then use for your R project, R Studio, R Markdown, and we will give hints on similar tools for other languages. So please stay with us for the next one and a half hour. Yeah, and uh, let's say I used, I started to use Jupyter with my um, like math exercises. I did not actually start uh, coding with Jupyter first. So let's say it. It includes Markdown cells, so you can mm -hmm. only use it for Markdown if you want to. Of course, the main functionality is for coding, but this is just another anecdote here. Yeah. What do you like about them, about notebooks? I think the cell cellular uh, form uh, and the user interface, that's what I like the most. So. Mm -hmm. So that I can have some code and or text here, and then um, copy paste it in in these chunks, and handle the text in these chunks, and move around uh, chunks, mm -hmm. <laughs> the dimension chunks. And you can then try this one chunk at a time, and then once yeah. it's working, you can move on to the next chunk. Yeah. Uh, here we have. Um, we mentioned that the uh, Jupyter Notebook functionalities are widely used, for example, in Visual Studio Code, Google Colab, GitHub Code Spaces, and we also have, uh, I can show shortly this Visual Studio Code. It looks really similar than in, in an actual Jupyter Lab. Then we also have here some uh, case examples. Uh, these are actual research projects that have shared their code in they, they use to be the lab and they have shared their code so you can check it out here's uh two examples at least and there's a gallery of interesting to be the notebooks so we recommend to check them out uh see how they look when you have the first glance of them uh think how it's easier 
to in um, understand what's going on in there compared to that if it just are handled handled with uh, regular code files and text files yeah so what is nice about them is that we can look at the code and through the browser we can even write it through the browser that's not the only way so matthias might show us also other ways of creating a notebook but it's a way to write code in the browser look at it in the browser and have code and documentation in the same place and the documentation lesson instructor in me is happy about that because then we have really not only the code but also a story that goes with it both and they both go together yeah we have listed here some use cases and what does this mean this linear workflow then so what i meant by that is that these are codes that first do something then do something else then do something else in a very linear way so the, the way i scroll through a notebook this is how the program progresses it reads the data it uh, filters the data it does some statistics with it and at the end it creates some images and if if i have a problem like that then it fits very well into a notebook another example is a like machine learning model training a model running a model uh, that fits typically very well into a notebook yeah i agree so what would be an example of this non-linear code flow so here nonlinear would be a project that has several files where there is not just one path through the code so anything more complicated um, a code that interacts with the user and depending on the interaction depending on the input does different things and branches out yeah that would fit less well so it's like maybe case by case mm -hmm. and you can always start with Jupyter and then uh, move to something else if it's not serving the purpose anymore. But at least for this testing and starting out and testing uh, what do you want to do and that kind of thing, I think Jupyter is a great tool. Yeah, it's good for testing, good for teaching, good as a thing that we can publish together with a paper. And as Matthias said, it's a good starting point. And tomorrow when we talk about modular core development, we will go through this process. We will start with something small, it will grow, and we will grow out of, let's say, notebooks. Yeah. Should we go to the next let's chapter and actually see how we start with Jupyter Lab? And um, with this, uh, you can try to type along, but if like if you fall, then just follow, and you have time to to do this the same thing in the exercise. And so I'm following this lecture, but now I'm moving on to my uh, own terminal. So here, first I would suggest that you create a new folder. I already have one, so I'm in my cool new folder. And what I do first, I activate Conda. code refinery conda environment is and it possible then... to make the font just slightly bigger if it's yes, easy to of do yes of course yeah and then i with the code refinery conda environment activated i just write to be the lab and i might just do the no browser thing so i want to select which browser i uh, open this to be the lab so is it then like this? This is the first time I try no browser thing. Usually when you run the code, just Jupyter Lab, uh, it opens automatically this uh, Jupyter Lab view to your default browser. Mm -hmm. Now I wanted to select which browser I open this window in. So I check out the output of the command and I copy this line, right? And this is, so now again, should we try that at the same time? Should we watch? What is our recommendation for everybody, how they should participate now? My, like basic recommendation is just to watch, but mm -hmm. uh, if you feel like this is quite easy, you can also do it. Yeah. 
Okay, here it says copy and paste one of these URLs. Thank you. I go to my browser and copy paste that in. So what we did now is we went into the environment. We started something called Jupyter Lab, and you will do that later in the exercise. And then you can open up this Jupyter Lab in the browser. Yeah. The command uh, initialized this notebook server, and uh, then we open it in a browser. So this is the basic view of Jupyter Lab, and by default it opens this launcher window, which is nice. From here we can go to terminal, text file, markdown file, uh, etc. But what we want to do now is start a notebook. So I just click the notebook icon here, and here I see a new file that appeared. So that's now the notebook. It's untitled yet. And this main win window is now where we can edit the notebook. Uh, first thing that I do is I save. Here's a save icon and I rename the file. And that's a good first reflex. Uh, we should not leave it untitled. Untitled yeah, unless untitled there's going to be many untitled files. Yeah. About the notification here, what, what, what do we see here? There's the file browser. So if we do new files, they appear in here. This is the folder here that's a root. It's the folder where I was in when I first time uh, run this command. Yeah. So that's why I told first to create a new folder, then run the command. Mm -hmm. What if I created it in the wrong folder? Is there any way for me to escape out of this? Or can I go sort of up or do I need to start a new node or lab in a different place? Uh, I actually have never tried that. So what I would do is just kill the whole server and, and uh, start a new one in the correct and folder. So I admit that I will do the same. So I don't know the answer. Uh, yeah. I don't. I have a feeling that it either is not possible, or I don't know how to do it. I would, I would stop the whole thing, go to a different place, start a new one. Yeah. And so here we can create new folders, new files. It's quite handy. You don't have to go to your um, Windows or other file browser to do new files. And uh, what else we have here in this com? Um, toolbar left hand side uh, there's a list of notebook kernels i don't know why i would use it i usually have only one at a time open have you mm -hmm. used this one no i never went into that tab yeah then there's uh, the git plugin uh, if this is installed and that's why i like the code refinery conda environment because it comes installed there and uh, this is i think we have been teasing a little bit of this jupyter git stuff uh, yeah. last week and it's here now behold mm -hmm. and then uh would you tell me what, what this tab is actually i think this is for plugins to is it though uh, is it to install the last plugins? one is the last oh. one is for extensions, yeah. I never use this one. What I did, do usually, I uh, check out files, sorry mm -hmm. for zooming, and then the Git tab. Mm -hmm. That's it, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So what can we do now in the, uh, for, so the Git integration, people can try out because now, uh, now the buttons suddenly make sense. There is initializing, we yeah. know what that means. Then you can stage and commit. And now let's, here we can write some code and some comments, huh? Yeah. So what are these cells that we have in, in the Jupyter, what I already mentioned, those chunks? Uh, there are two types, actually three types of cells, markdown and code. And I just copy paste some examples here. So now the first cell is markdown cell and the second one is code cell. And the idea is that you use the markdown cells for uh, explaining what you do and all that kind of things. And then you use the code cells to actually run a code. 
Mm -hmm. And how do you run the code? I do shift enter and we have here a list of let's see here scrolling down the lesson there's the markdown cell that i copy pasted code cell and we have a list of keyboard shortcuts to use these shortcuts there's the mention of command and edit modes this might be the first first ui interaction thing that to know about uh, Jupyter Lab. So when I select a cell, I press enter to, to go into the cell edit mode. Here I can write new text and stuff. Then I go with escape, I go back to the command mode. And there I can now use these cell uh, shortcuts to copy paste cells. Now it's there twice, uh, delete the cells, etc. And Can you also show uh, how to create a new markdown cell? Somebody asked about that. So yes. if I want a new markdown cell at the beginning or in the middle somewhere, how would you do it? Yeah. Uh, in this command mode, so pressing ESC first, uh, now you can insert cells above and below with A or B. So it's below and ab above. And then you change the cell to markdown cell by pressing M. You see there's this menu that changed. So you can, of course, use the menu here to, to change the cells. But uh, using the shortcuts M and Y, yeah. it's uh, quite handy. And how did you get into this? Because you removed again the code. Did you did you remove it? Or why, why, do, why is it gone? Yeah, I deleted the, the okay. cells that were there. And now I would actually copy paste this uh, table of shortcuts here to a markdown cell. So like a recap, we go with enter, we go to this edit mode. Mm -hmm. And with ESC, we go from away from the edit mode. So this command mode, we can run the cell with, there's a, a few different options, but I usually just do shift enter. Mm -hmm. And we can delete and undo insert cells and cut, cut, copy and paste cells. Yeah, there are also these icons to the right. So on each cell, if, if you run over it, we can then write. So we can move things up and down and delete. Yeah, That's nice. One more thing that might be useful in the exercise is how do you run all the cells? So we can imagine we have 20 cells there. There is a lot of code. How do I run everything from top to bottom? Yeah, like this. Now I would like to run everything. Um, I think there is a probably a shortcut for that. No, but yeah, at least I... in the menu, here's a run menu and you can run all cells. Mm -hmm. Do you know a shortcut? I don't know the shortcut, but the okay. run all cells I use all the time. Those of you who know the yeah. shortcut, share it on document. Also, there was this restart kernel and run all cells. Yeah, what's the difference between running all cells and restarting before that? So the restart kernel will basically uh, wipe out all the variables that existed. It will be like a clean start. So sometimes I need that. If I want to make sure that all variables are reset, I want to run the whole notebook from top to bottom the same way that my colleague will run it for the first time when they get it from me. So, for example, if, let's say, Jupyter, in, in Jupyter, when you code, you can actually do these kind of things that you uh, define some variables. Oh, let me just clean up a little bit. That you define some variables in, in here, and then you check out what the re result is using those variables. So re you reference, uh, reference to those, and then you start to reorganize your code. And for some reason, you do this. Now the referencing is in here and the variable uh, declarations are here yeah if you run it now the, it works if but, you run all cells, but if you restart kernel yeah. and run all cells, then it will start noticing that the variable is undefined so that's a good thing to do before publishing the notebook because then you are sure that this will also run for other people yeah so if you get this kind of error uh, in this case the correct way is to make sure that you don't reference to those variables before uh, 
you have declared them. So okay. now uh, we are soon, it's time for, so that you can test it out on, on your own. Yep. Anything else we need to explain before before we send people into exercise? We should tell them what, what the exercise is. So if you go back to the material. Yeah. Can I mention still that there were quite a many of those people who, in, in the icebreaker, there was people who uh, mentioned that they are using Visual Studio Code. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to show is that I have now a Visual Studio Code window open in the same folder that I just created this example. And I can open the Jupyter Notebook file inside Visual Studio Code. Uh, may, basically, the same uh, commands uh, work, same shortcuts work. Uh, now it seems I don't have Python, Python here, but anyhow, it works. Works also in in Visual Studio Code if you have the environment. Going to the exercise. Yeah. So what's Should this I about? Do you want to explain? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. So here the goal will be that we will try this out, uh, go into the Codefiner environment, start JupyterLab, open up the JupyterLab in your browser, and create a notebook. And here we have step by step. We also have the cells that you can copy paste into your notebook. Of course, you can experiment with something else in, instead. So if you scroll a little bit down, there are some suggestions on a little bit more. So in this green, the green box, that's our goal. Yeah. Uh, to create a markdown cell, some equations, because we want to see that this works, images, some code. And if you are curious about what is the code doing, this is, this is one way to approximate the the pi 3.14 etc etc so it's an appro approximation by you can imagine randomly throwing darts onto a dartboard and counting how many are inside the circle and how many are outside yeah the picture tries to uh, illustrate that and we will get 20 minutes for the exercise yeah just checking whether there is anything optional as well for those who want to do a bit more but I think that's I think it's enough to do for 20 minutes to get this to get this going. Keep continue asking on the document. Let us know how it's go how it goes. Yes, I think there's and... no optional stuff. So create a new folder, open uh, Jupyter there with Code Refinery Conda environment activated, and uh, start copy pasting the cells. See what they do. Yeah, and I'm just noting on the document, maybe you can share it. So the exercise will be until, well, let's do 45. And the goal is, I'm copy pasting, is this one. Oh, it is there, good. And then we'll be back, 45 past. Looking forward. Yep. Good luck. Bye. See you then. Welcome I back. Like the core. I like, really like the quote at the end, suspense. What will happen now? <laughs> so first, uh, how did it go? How did the exercise go? Please let us know. Was it too much to do, too little to do? Did it get stuck? This yeah. helps us. So and then we go next to this version control chapter. Yeah, so how about version control? We were, we, last week we spent 10 hours on Git and GitHub. So We've we been teasing told... this Jupyter yeah. thing. Yeah, so how about that? Can you go back to your 
we created this notebook, but um, shouldn't we start tracking it in Git? Yeah. Also. So I also did this exercise, and uh, now I'm in. I see the notebook here. I have this Git tab open in the left toolbar, and the first thing I would do because this is now a new project. Uh, I don't have anything existing yet. I would do git init, right? Exactly. So it would be this middle button here, initialize repository. It's basically the same thing than git init command. It asks me, am I sure? I am sure. Thank you. And now a new view appears here in this git uh, tab. We have the repository name here. It knows which repository we are in. It knows which branch we are in. Uh, I can click this branch to uh, see other branches and change between uh, a switch between branches. The first thing, this is the staging area. And now the first thing I see that there's a lot of untracked files. So what should I do? Yeah, these files should be either staged or they should be ignored. Yeah. At least I recognize that these are the files that I've been creating. I have now three notebooks here. One of them you are seeing uh, here, right hand mm -hmm. side. So at least those I want to stage and track. So I have this plus button here. I press that for each of these files that I want to stage and track. So this is now git add command, right? Exactly, that's the equivalent of a git add. Yeah. And how about this? This It's something checkpoint, checkpoint. So these are things that I typically ignore. So I add them to the dot git ignore file, if you remember that from last week. And because we are here, I, I would like to not go into some text editor. So I right click and I add this file to git ignore. There's this oh, option. Amazing, I didn't know. Yeah, it it throws me this error, but if I just dismiss, it actually works. Mm -hmm. I do it for the next file. So I add this to git ignore and now I can see what's in this git ignore. Uh, here. The, it should open this file. Okay, it's not opening this file. But last time, at least, uh, it really added those there. I tracked mm -hmm. that file as well. And I make my first commit to, to commit these first changes. Yeah. Good. Okay. And now that you committed, now we might then decide to push the changes to GitHub. We will not show that, but there are extensions that can integrate also with GitHub, but you could also in the command line uh, push the changes or upload the notebook to GitHub and we could start collaborating. And once we start doing that, we might notice something interesting. Should I take the screen share and demonstrate? Yes, please. So just a second, I need to make sure I take the right thing. And just as a heads up, we are we are less than 10 minutes away from a break. So we did not forget. Here I have the screen. So let's imagine that Matthias now pushed the notebook to, to GitHub. And this is how it might look. So this is the notebook that you have maybe created during the exercise. And I can browse it here, here somewhere on GitHub. So there are the images and the code blocks and the output. This notebook is static, static in a sense that I, I can't go in and edit. I, I cannot click on the cells. They are, they are, they are statically here, there. So it's like a preview then. Mm -hmm. We will later after the break also show you how you can share a dynamic notebook that people can really run and modify. So now we have it here, it's static, but we can start collaborating. You know, we branch and I make some improvements. Yeah. But once we start doing that, 
we will notice that we will have a bit of a surprise. And the surprise is that if I look at the notebook and I look at what is really underneath, underneath the notebook, if I look at the code, the code is something called JSON. It's a data format to store the, the, the data and metadata of the notebook. So this is what is underneath the notebook. Do I have to understand this code? No, we don't have to understand it. We also Great. don't edit it. This is Jupyter Labs creates this for me. But now that we start collaborating, we will notice that I want to show you an example. And I will first start here on GitHub. And then, then we will come to some of the tools that are really useful to have. And you have them already in your code, uh, code refinery Conda environment. But they are really must have tools. I will open this link. And if you want to browse with me, you can browse with me. I will open it up in my browser. And let's imagine that I sent Matthias now a pull request. He allowed diff. What is so there was some change was made. And now Matthias should decide whether this is a good change or a bad change. But I have it no would be really idea. hard. So this doesn't look too here we have a bit of a sense of betrayal because we were told Git was good and Jupyter was good. And now we see this. We don't really know what is what was there before, what was there after. So apparently that's an image. Yeah, that's an image. So some image changed, some other stuff changed. And here what I wanted you to know about, and this is also then explained in the material, is that on GitHub by default, it doesn't look very useful once we start comparing changes and reviewing pull requests in notebooks, in Jupyter notebooks. But you can you can enable one preview feature, which is which you can access by clicking on your your avatar. And then okay. there are these feature preview. And there are a couple of interesting features that you may or may not know about, but the one that is interesting here is this rich Jupyter notebook diffs. Nice. And if I enable it, enable, it will give me a much nicer comparison of notebooks. So now it's enabled. And if I now reload this, I just do here, reload the page. Suspense. Now it's much nicer for the person to see what has changed. I have changed here the color and I have changed dimensions. And you can also see how the images have changed that have been generated here. Much nicer to for collaboration and uh, and code review. So it really renders the like both old output and the new output. Yeah. So here old is red, new is green. And it's either left and right or on top of each other if it doesn't fit. If yeah. I if I would increase my screen, maybe it would be left and right. And the tool that makes this, so there is an extension which is a must have, and it's this NB dime notebook diff and merge, which helps when comparing notebooks and merging notebooks. And this is also the tool that GitHub uses under the hood. This is a tool that you need, but this is also a tool that you have. It's part of the code refinery environment. And this helps you when working with Git and notebooks, either locally or on GitHub GitLab. Looking at the time, five minutes before the hour, that's fantastic. I wonder whether I should say anything more here. I managed to create the similar view in this Jupyter lab. All right, good. Let me maybe take the screen from me and show us how it looks in Jupyter lab. And we have the instructions in the material. So Matthias has been following what, what you can find a little bit lower on the same page. Yeah. I'm, maybe I used wrong colors, but what I did is I just made the edit here mm. and saved the notebook. So it uh, appears in, in here as a, uh, changed and here there's this uh, one little button which is diff this file I click that one and I get this similar looking view and here's the old output and the new new output and I want to change the background color not the not the mm -hmm. circle color yeah so all is good we can use git and Jupyter, Jupyter notebooks and we should uh, we will so far we haven't shown you yet how we can share a dynamic notebook that people can modify and run and rerun and reproduce 
um, in the browser without even installing anything. So we will do that after break. After break, we will discuss sharing notebooks and creating reproducible notebooks using a wonderful service called Binder. Until then, everybody enjoy your break. We will be back at seven minutes past the hour. Yep, see you. Looking forward to that. See you then, bye. Welcome back. Yeah, welcome back. Thanks, Matthias, for the music. It's wonderful. Um, we have 22 minutes left. We, we will still do an exercise session. But before going there, let's create a context. How do we share notebooks? How do you share notebooks, Matthias? Uh, apart from this binder that we're going to test, uh, Actually, I have not tested it myself with any, any, like colleagues. Um, usually, I just um, go by GitHub links. Yeah, so I also use GitHub. Um, sometimes I put the notebook on Zenodo if I wanted to really make sure that it stays accessible, and if I want it to be citable. There are lots of services here listed. Yeah, it would be nice to go through all of those myself, testing out. Uh, one that I have tested is this Google Colab. It's a, it looks really much like a Jupyter Lab. Uh, I think some of the shortcuts might not be the same, but otherwise, like, uh, it looks similar. The nice thing is that it's the same file format. It's the same file. So you can then move the notebook between the call up and back to GitHub, back to somewhere else. You can open it up again in JupyterLab because they use the same .ipy and B notebook format. The one service that we will now want to show you because we think it's really good if you know that this exists is Binder. It's an, it's an open source solution to create live notebooks, which can be on GitHub or somewhere else on Zenodo. And then you can send somebody a link and they can run your notebook in the browser. They don't even have, they don't need anything else installed. All they need is a browser. It's this exercise. And we wanted you to test it out. You can do this without command line. You can do it purely on, purely on GitHub. If you got stuck and you didn't, you were not able to create a notebook, you can take our notebook and you can download it and then upload it to GitHub. For those of you who don't write Python, but write R and are still here, thanks for staying. You can test this out to have an R Markdown, R Studio project, dynamically live runnable by anybody. So you can use the same service to deploy R Studio. So for the R developers, test, test out this path. For Python, Jupyter, people interested in Python, Jupyter, test out this one. And I will put the link to, to this exercise into the document. On it. Thanks a lot. And we will then, we would then give you 20 minutes. We would return half, pa half past for a very brief summary and feedback. But basically this will be it. And maybe we will also hear one more, one more nice music sequence. So good luck with the exercise. See you again, 30 minutes past the hour for a quick summary. See you. Welcome back. Welcome back. Thanks, Matthias. Uh, everybody, please stay with us for three more minutes. We will summarize in three minutes and then there will be more music. And that will be that will be today. You have maybe tried the binder exercise. I tried it on my side. 
So here is my repository. I uploaded the notebook from before. You have maybe managed to create this batch. And if you tried it first time, it, it maybe took a couple of minutes to install the dependencies. But now when I open it again, it should only take a few seconds. And it will open a notebook, install the dependencies. How does it know the dependencies? They are documented in requirements.txt, nicely connecting what we learned yesterday. And it will open a notebook with dependencies installed. I can then run this notebook and anybody can run it um, and all they need is the browser. And of course now, because I try to demonstrate it, it takes longer than a few seconds. But I will use the time to tell you that there is one more episode that you can have a look at. It's the summary episode. And to summarize here, there is a lot more that is possible. You can write entire books. Entire books have been written in Jupyter. Have a look at this Jupyter book project. Um, the, the Jew in Jupyter refers to Julia. The R in Jupyter refers to the R language. You can, you can do Julia and R and lots of other language in Jupyter. But we also wanted to point you to tools like R Shiny, R Markdown and Pluto, which are then really dedicated tools for these languages. One thing that you will also notice when starting writing notebooks is that at some point you will come into the situation that you have several notebooks and they look really similar because there, there is this code portion that you want to reuse in also in the other notebooks. And instead of duplicating the code, here you can find some hints on how to solve this. How can you reuse the code across notebooks? And here's an example. So if this sounds interesting, go through this at, or at your own time. And then please let us know how it went today. Um, how yeah, was we really the, appreciate the feedback. Yeah, how was the speed? How, if you, have you, are you aware that we publish videos, video recordings, and we would like to know, is there value in this? Should we continue doing that? Does it make sense? And if, if you watch these, how do you watch them? Is it something that you use complementary to the course or for later? And then tell us, let us know one thing that was really good today, one thing that we should improve for next time and any free form comments. And I want to thank so much all the people who helped us today on the document here in the studio, in the exercise rooms. Big thanks to Samantha earlier today. I forgot to thank, that was a lot of fun to co-teach and thanks to Matthias, that was, that was really a blast. And I will give back to Matthias for, to, for some more music and to close the day. Thanks everybody.